Our next speaker uh, is Dr. Ram Chandani, who's been a pain management doc with our group for just over the past year. Um, he's one of those people that was really conflicted because he got his undergraduate degree at Cal and then trained at Stanford. So he probably didn't talk about it much with his colleagues when he was there. But uh, Dr. Ram Chandani is going to talk about a topic that we're all faced with who prescribe uh, opioid medication. And uh, the topic is the opiate conundrum, angst, anxiety, and answers. Dr. Ram Chandani. Guess I don't need that, okay. Thank you everybody for your attention today and uh, appreciate everybody for putting this together, NCMA and St. Joseph's. I've been in town for the last um, about eight months now, and I'm talking to you today about a topic that's been a big deal for us, the opioid conundrum, especially for us pain docs. Um, I'm at the Redwood Pain Institute at uh, Soto Yomi, right across from the Santa Rosa Memorial Hospital. I have a couple financial disclosures. I do talk for Boston Scientific and Nuvectra, um, a part of the product advisory board for Boston Scientific. Mission today is to empower providers to utilize methods to better manage pain. We have many methods and abilities to use different things, including opioids to manage pain. We want to use them appropriately and not get in trouble for it and not get our patients in trouble for it. I'm a pain medicine physician and I trained in physiatry at Stanford. I went to undergrad at Berkeley, went to Chicago Medical School, and then after I finished fellowship at Oregon Health Sciences University, I went back and got my MBA from Cornell because I realized I didn't know enough about the business of medicine. So I went back and got my MBA and I hopefully now know more about medicine and the business of medicine after my MBA than I did before. I realized that most physicians don't get any training in the business of medicine before they finish their fellowship or during fellowship or during residency. And it was really important for me to learn more about what exactly we're doing. As far as pain management goes, most of our patients are scared and worried about their future. They don't know when they're going to have pain. They don't know how much pain they're going to suffer for the rest of their lives. They've lost trust in their healthcare providers because Oftentimes, the healthcare providers judge these patients because they see the amount of pain medicines that they're on. They see how they sometimes have a lot of difficulty expressing themselves because of the amount of pain medicine they're on or the type of pain that they've been experiencing. This is 31% of our patients have chronic pain and 10% of Americans have disability due to their chronic pain. This is more than heart disease, cancer, and diabetes combined. That is a heck of a lot of people. And we do not have enough pain medicine doctors to treat all these people. So a lot of times, it's not up to me only as a pain medicine physician in the pain medicine community to treat these patients. We rely on everybody to treat these patients properly with their pain. From the IOM, this was a blueprint of trans Transforming Prevention, Care, Education, Research from the Institute of Medicine, published in 2011. These are a couple patient uh, sayings in here. It's been hell. First, you have to find someone who believes you. Doctors don't recognize pain. They cannot see or diagnose the specific issue. The stigma is one of the biggest barriers. I've been treated like a lowlife by medical people when I disclose I have chronic pain and use opioids for it. I've seen so many patients that say this and have problems like this, and they don't feel tr that they can trust their provider. So the conundrum for primary care providers, is they're told in residency, at least nowadays, not to prescribe opioids because it causes addiction. Patients are not adequately treated because all their non-opioid options have been used. The history of pain management. I'm going to talk a little bit about why we're in the conundrum that we're in now. Opioids have been around since the 1500s. 
Initially, it was opium. Then we had heroin, morphine, oxycodone. In fact, you could go to Sears in the 1800s and get heroin over the counter. Most opioids, when initially discovered, they were found to be less addictive than the next one. Of course, they weren't, but they were thought to be that way. In the 1980s, we came up with the idea of the addiction as a moral failing. The only thing worse than being addicted, or the only thing worse than dying is to die addicted. Patients with chronic, with chronic pain were described as was lazy, addicted, crazy. 25 to 50 percent of people coming back from Vietnam were addicted to heroin. That's a heck of a lot of people. Then this paper came out by Herschel Jick. It was in the 1980 letter to the editor. It's actually not even a paper, not even peer reviewed. And it showed that 1,100 patients were treated with opioids and only four got addicted. This letter to the editor was not supported by any evidence other than the two um, uh, references underneath there, which were also written by Herschel Jick. And these were all based on hospital patients. So this, these were hospitalized patients on low doses of opioids. This was referenced, therefore, frequently after this for the next couple decades about why opioids are not that risky. Guess what? 47% of Americans today are addicted to some substance. How many of you, even us in here, drink coffee in the morning? Okay, that's an addiction. <laughs> Non-substances can be included in this. Some of us bite our nails. Some of us smell gas at the gas station and like it. That could be an addiction. 15% of the US are addicted to actual medications. Tobacco, 17%. Drug, 15%. Alcohol abuse is 7%. So what happened after we decided, guess what? Opioids are good to use for everybody. We suddenly had an increase in ER admissions and the total number of deaths in prescription opioids. But what we see between 2010 and 2017 is the, the deaths due to prescription opioids really haven't changed. What's happened I'll get to this in a second, is that we've had so many more opioids coming from outside and people already addicted on these medicines that the deaths have gone up. I'll show that in a slide in a minute here. What we don't look at is suicides. Did you know that there are 836,000 self-inflicted injuries with ER visits in the US annually? 100,000 suicide attempts. 41,000 suicides annually. I, re I read the statistic recently about gun violence, and this is a big topic. 70% of all gun violence is suicide. That's crazy. So here's the overdose deaths invol involving opioids. You can see in this slide that any opioid has really gone up but they're mostly synthetic opioids that have gone up recently. Heroin's gone up. Fentanyl and tramadol, what we call fentanyl that we prescribe, is very different than the fentanyl on the street because it's a lot more, it's pure fentanyl and it's brought in overseas. So that's, uh, that's what the synthetic opioid there is talking about. But the commonly prescribed opioids has kind of stayed stable since 2010. So when we look at opioid deaths, there are 18,000 illicit opioid deaths. That's street fentanyl, heroin, 15,000 prescription opioids. Now, are these diverted opioids? Are these an active pain treatment? How many of these are diverted? How many of these do patients get and sell it to someone else and then sell it to someone else and then sell it to someone else? And then it suddenly causes a death. 33,000 opioid deaths. That's the problem. So the Surgeon General gets wind of this, and guess what, puts out this, this letter to everybody. And most physicians that I know has, have received this letter, or received it in August 2016. 
And then the CDC comes out with all these guidelines for chronic pain. So all of us out there who are prescribing opioids say, oh my God, now I have to keep my opioids under this limit. What am I going to do? And then we have this study that just came out, actually in JAMA on March 6, 2018. It says that it does not support the initiation of opioid therapy for moderate to severe chronic back pain or hip or knee arthro osteoarthritis pain. Now, all right. So I get it. There's no significant difference in one year follow up with patients. There's no change in function. There's no significant difference in the two adverse reactions. But there are more side effects with opioids. Of course there are. Right? We're using opioids for pain management. Now, how about those guys that have had six back surgeries? Is that counted on here? How about those guys that have had, you know, three failed knees? Does that count it on here? It didn't talk about that on the study. So I take these studies sometimes with a grain of salt. The main problem with the opioid epidemic is that it has resulted from a large part of us failing to realize that substance abuse is a big deal. And we haven't provided adequate treatment resources to these patients. Our ethical dilemma every day in clinic, for me especially being pain management physician, opioids don't help everyone. But they help a majority of people and they're easily abused. If they're used appropriately, I see my patients do very well in their function. Some patients on low dose opioids, some patients on higher dose opioids. But there's this, you know, magical number. Is there this magical number? I don't know. Only 46% of primary care providers consider themselves sufficiently trained to prescribe opioids. And 29% prescribe less opioids because of federal oversight. State oversight, too. Younger providers are more reluctant nowadays to prescribe opioids. Do their worries about dependence, about suicide, about all these other things that we were talking about, and knowledge gaps. So here's the little question. When should I prescribe opioids? Always start with non-opioids. Always start with something else than, you know, your Norco three times a day. Add adjuncts before we do anything else. Add gabapentin, pregabalin, tricyclates, antidepressants. Of course, some people can't take these. Some people have allergies to everything under the sun. You can add tramadol. You can add non-medication treatments, physical therapy, other interventions. You know, do a trigger point injection on these patients. Get them a TENS unit. Get them a brace. Do something else. So what opioids and why opioids? If we have patients that have this chronic pain, we have all this evidence. Yeah, but sometimes patients need some functional improvement. Do you want them to be sitting down and not doing anything for months and months and months while they have this acute thing that's going to go away because they just had surgery? Well, probably need a few opioids in the meantime. So a minimum dose for three to seven days for acute pain. Reevaluate re after one to four weeks. These are all from the CDC guidelines and avoid long-acting opioids. And in my practice, I've tried to avoid long-acting opioids as much as possible. It's actually been quite successful to keep patients down on their dose by avoiding these long-acting opioids and avoid side effects. So the key here is what is our goal? What are we trying to do? If we're going to give patients opioids, what is their goal over the next year? You want to see an improvement in function. That's the key. So if it's a non-malignant patient, which are most patients with chronic pain, you're going to look at a goal-based treatment plan. And now I'm talking about my physiatry roots. We talk about function and rehabilitation, getting patients better so that they can do their activities. So I look at their goal-based function. And if patients are not getting better, if their pain levels even if their pain levels stay the same, but they're able to do more work, or they're able to go to work because of their opioids, that is key. Now, if they're not able to do that, it may not be the right thing to do. Now, what are the guidelines? What, how do I prescribe a patient an opioid without getting the medical board on me? 
Well, urine drug monitoring. This is the number one thing. Medical board here in California, and where I was last in Texas, recommend doing urine drug monitoring. Now, California has different guidelines than Texas. They're different states. They're very different states. But at the same time, the guidelines are pretty similar in the sense that everybody should have a drug screen several times a year. Now, if a patient's higher risk, you do it more often. Patients lower risk, you do it less often. And the patients that are lowest risk, you'll still do a urine drug screen. Even your 85-year-old with chronic back pain that has lumbar stenosis and is on Eliquis and is not a patient for, for any sort of treatment uh, or any sort of surgery. Why would you do that? Well, what happens if their son or daughter or someone in their, in their house is taking their drugs? Then their drug screen would be negative. Guess what? They're not using their drugs. They're diverting their drugs. This is the problem. We check a cures report. So a cures report is an online database, the prescription database system for California. And it'll show you what prescriptions patients have had within their last six months or last year. You can change it based on what you want. Now, in other states, they have a much wider network. So in Texas, for example, where I came from last, that's why I'm saying that, they have this PDMP that actually references about 30 states. So you can click on all the states and get a result for all the prescriptions they've had in the last last year from those 30 states, which is wonderful. Psych screening. So if you think this patient is looking for drugs for no reason whatsoever, or they're schizophrenic, or they have some sort of addictive disorder, get a psych screen. And I know that is difficult in this community, as well as many other communities, just because many of the psychologists and psychiatrists don't take insurance. So it is more difficult to get psych screening. But still, it's important. Aberrant behaviors, and I'm going to go through a whole slide on aberrant behaviors. Monthly follow-ups. Yes, even the patient on three Norcos should have a monthly follow-up. Why? Because what happens if they're missing a few? What happens if the state looks at you funny after they've gone three months and you've given them three prescriptions and they have 270 uh, pain pills that they suddenly divert and then they come to your office and say what's going on with this guy? No THC. So I know this is a controversial topic. No marijuana. Why not marijuana? We'll talk about that in a minute too. No alcohol. No alcohol. Why? Because it's sedating. And it's an addiction. Alcohol can be an addiction at least. No schedule ones. That means no cocaine. Well, cocaine's a Schedule II, but no LSD, no heroin, none of those things. And no benzos without a clear psychiatric diagnosis. And the reason why I say this is also the same reason as alcohol. Now, benzos and some other medicines can actually combine and cause more sedation and cause a high. And I'll talk about that in a minute as well. So why no THC? So this is a, t this is a slide about initiations of illicit drugs. So if you look at what drug caused people to get into illicit drug habits, marijuana, 70.3% of the time, is the initiator for any sort of drug habit. That's why we don't use pain medicines when patients are on marijuana. Now, I know it's legal here in the US for recreational use, blah, 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 blah. But still, that's what studies say. Aberrant behaviors. So I have a patient coming in saying, I want my Dilaudid. That is a no-no. <laughs> no. Uh, if they are intoxicated in your office, please don't prescribe any meds to them that are intoxicating. If they're refusing other treatments, the patient comes with axial low back pain they've had for five years, and they haven't done anything for it except for take their Norco three times a day. Well, if they're 85 and they have chronic back pain, different story. But if they're 45 and they have chronic back pain, come on, go get some treatment, get better, go back to work. That's what we do, right? That's why we're here on Saturday. Increase in dosing without notification. I had a patient, 
70 years old, I think. And she started taking 50 of fentanyl instead of 25. She put an extra patch on without informing us. It's dangerous. And guess what? That's a no-no. Guess what? I sent them to an addictionologist. They got on Suboxone. That was their only option. They used a non-prescribed route of dosing. So I had a patient on Suboxone. And guess what they did? They mixed it with alcohol and started shooting up Suboxone. Why would you shoot up Suboxone? It has naloxone in it. It's not going to work. Anyway, don't do that. They go to ER, urgent care, to get other medicines. So without your knowledge, they go to the emergency room without, you know, oh, I have so much pain. Well, call me first. Maybe we can figure something out. No, they go to the ER and constantly go get more morphine or go get an injection of Dilaudid or something like that. That's a no-no. If they intentionally overdose, obviously, well, yeah, that's an aberrant behavior. But if they unintentionally overdose, say they have renal disease, something that pops up, and they're on morphine 15 milligrams three times a day, only 45 mil equivalents of morphine, but guess what? They suddenly have renal disease, it piles up, and they have an overdose because of the renal disease. That's not good. You want to be careful with those patients. Cures shows multiple prescribers. Yeah, well, if they had surgery last month, that's a different story. But if they've had six different prescribers over, this, over the last six months and they're on a chronic dose of pain medicine, that's not good. Another physician has discharged due to prescribing habits. So this patient is taking too much pain medicine all the time, they, they're abusing their drugs, or they had one of these other aberrant behaviors at one of their other providers, it may not be a good idea. They refuse, a, they refuse to sign an opioid agreement. Patients need to sign an opioid agreement if you're going to be in chronic pain. That is a medical board law. Or if they divert their drugs. How do you know if they're diverting their drugs? That's why you do urine drug screen. You check whether it's in their system. Now, there are ways that they can divert it without having it in their, with, with having it in their system, too. But at some point, we're doing too much policing. Best practices for opioid prescription. Don't use benzos in conjunction unless if there's a clear psychiatric diagnosis. I was at a conference recently and talking to a psychiatrist, and he's like, why do we use benzos? We don't need benzos. There's so many other drugs we can use for anxiety. And he doesn't use any benzos in his practice at all. Don't use carisperidol. So Soma, this is a pretty big drug for muscle relaxants. Now, Soma was made for a reason to be less toxic. I was just online on a forum, believe it or not, just went and typed Soma High. You guys look at it sometime. Oh my God. Patients are just taking two tablets of Soma and feeling like with a little Vicodin, they're like, oh my God, I get a high. Jeez. That's why we don't prescribe Soma. Taper patients off opioids, don't just stop them. Now this could be a problem. If you, don't don't stop, if you stop them on pain medicine, they could go through all sorts of side effects, withdrawal symptoms. They won't be happy with you. Maybe they won't be happy with you even if you did taper them off nicely. But at the same time, we have to make sure that they are aware that you've tapered them off and why you're tapering them off. And you can see them once a week, once every three days, once every five days, however you want to do it when you're tapering, tapering these patients off. And that's what I usually do. If I want to taper a patient off their pain medicine, I'll give them a week's worth of prescriptions, have them come back in a week, see how they're doing, and continue, continue doing it that way. Even if a patient wants to get off their medicines, I will still do it every two weeks or so. So what dose? According to the CDC, don't prescribe above 90 milligram equivalents of morphine. Now, I think if there are on higher than 90 milligram equivalents, they should come see a pain management physician. That's kind of why we're, why we're there, right? Patients are having uncontrolled pain on high doses of opioids. And, you know, why are they having pain? At that point, if someone's on that high dose, why? What's the reason for their pain? What's the diagnosis? Are they progressing towards their goals? Are they not? These are all questions. 
Are there any other non-opioid strategies that we can use to get rid of their pain? Now, you're in drug monitoring. Again, we talk about this all the time. Uh, if they're positive for unprescribed medications, if they're positive for illicit substances, positive for alcohol, or negative for, negative for their prescribed medicines, those are all red flags. But how about that cup test? You know, everybody gets this cup test in the office. These are super not reliable. And the reason is, if someone has an IV protonics uh, admission, it can show up as THC on this thing. So how is that reliable for us? Sudafed can show up as amphetamines. That's not, that's not cool. So LCMS and GCMS, which is called liquid chromatography or gas chromatography, is the ones that you know, we send off these urine drug screens to. And those are extremely reliable, 99% reliable. And these machines are millions of dollars. And they take about a week for your results to get back. So what should I do? As a provider, what should I do? If they fail with their medicine, what should I do? Should I prescribe, taper, send somewhere, addictionologist, pain management? It's a complicated question, and it's going to be patient-based. Make sure that the patient that you're treating wants to be helped. Do they really want to get help? Or are they there for getting their medicine and nothing else? They're on disability, they're sitting around, they're happy with sitting around on their couch and watching soap operas all day. Yeah, that may be them. But would you let your patient with high blood pressure get away with that? Would you let them do that? How about with diabetes, their blood sugar is 600. Would you let them get away with that? They're going to show up to the ER every, every couple weeks with diabetic ketoacidosis and finally die after a few weeks. Is that something you're going to let your patient away with? So what would you do with those patients? Think about your opioid patients the same way. Generally speaking, if the patient doesn't want to be helped, and they're usually there for the wrong reason. How can I help as a pain management physician? We help with injections, surgical procedures, medication management, and inpatient hospital consults. Now, I've done several inpatient hospital consults. So I do several a week. And I can treat patients with injections or treat their medications and do a bunch of things like that. The key thing, though, with a patient in pain is diagnosis is very important. You hear about pain management physicians and you hear about epidurals. They're kind of synonymous, right? But they're not for everybody. They don't necessarily help everybody. They can cause side effects. And this old adage of doing three epidurals in a row for a patient is really not proven. And was given over the last you know, 20, 30 years, that was what people used to do. They used to do uh, intralaminar epidural injections, and patients would not get better. Well, it's not proven. That's why. The most common back pain, 60%, in fact, is facet disease, joint pain in the low back, joint pain in the neck. Headaches, even, sometimes can be facet disease. Sometimes for headaches, even, I can do a nerve block and radiofrequency ablation for these patients, and they get better. Also, for low back pain, we do the same thing. We also do surgical procedures. We do spinal cord stimulation, intrathecal pump implantation, kyphoplasty and vertebroplasties as well. So those are neuromodulation devices. That's a morphine pump or something of the sort, and that's neuromodulation device. Kyphoplasty. So this is an interesting concept. A lot of people have gone away from doing kyphoplasties because there's some evidence that it doesn't help. There's also evidence that it does help. 46% of patients have less pain within one week. Decreases opioid use over the one year. If we're thinking about opioids, that's what I want to highlight. Non-surgical pain relief is only 14%. So if you see patients in pain after a week or two, not a bad idea to get a consult for a kyphoplasty. There's also low, lower mortality compared to non-surgical management. And about 33% of women and about 13% of men have vertebral compression fractures. 
about six minutes to go. So the future of pain management, innovation in pain in neuroscience. What do we need? Multimodal treatment. We need to treat these patients with not only our drugs, we need to treat them with functional improvement, with physical therapy, with TENS units, with bracing, with psychiatry, psychology. We need better screening tools for addiction, better screening tools for their pain. And we need to identify substance abuse disorder before it becomes a problem for these patients. We also need to make sure that we rule out abar aberrancies we keep function as a highlight. We prescribe opioids prudently, and we don't make the same mistakes that we made years ago. Now, I think one of the problems that's going on is that we've want, gone from one side of the spectrum to the other side of the spectrum, where patients are not getting the treatment that they need from, from their pain because patients are, or people are afraid to prescribe opioids. And I think that there's a balance, and we haven't found that balance yet. How about cancer? Is cancer any different? So a couple examples here. 59-year-old with chronic pain due to prostate cancer. Their life expectancy is more than 10 years. You know, what do you do for a patient like that? Do you treat them as a normal patient or as an end-of-life cancer patient? I would say treat them as a normal patient. How about a patient that doesn't have cancer? COPD, renal failure. They're going to die within a year. Do you treat this as a normal patient or as a cancer patient or what we thought as a cancer patient? You know, as far as opioids go, if this patient is in pain, am I really going to worry about substance abuse and that type of thing? Probably not. I'm going to wor worry about diversion, but substance abuse I'm not really worried about here. Now, a 36-year-old with post-radiation pain due to left throat, due to thyroid cancer, she's cancer-free, cancer life expectancy greater than 15 years. Again, this patient is going to be treated as a normal patient, not one that has end of life. Conclusions. We should never stop prescribing opioids completely. They're an essential part of our practice, essential part of surgical practice, non-surgical practice. We must be prudent with prescribing them, though. No more prescribing, you know, one gram of morphine a day for patients. I think that's... Those days have gone. We can't be policemen, but we need to be good mentors. There's a certain amount of things that we can do, but we can't be policing these, these patients as if we're the cops. That's not what we're supposed to do. And cancer pain patients, I think, can be treated differently because there's no, we're not really looking at the end of life. I mean, we're not looking at patients in the same way. They're not going to have substance abuse if they're going to die in six months. If they're on three grams of morphine at that point, oh well, as long as they're doing well. The main thing, though, is to give the best care to our patients and stay true to our mission. Any questions? So that's a good question. CBD is considered a Schedule One as well, but it doesn't show up in urine drug screens. <laughs> I don't know about efficacy. There's not, enough, there's not enough literature about efficacy of CBD. And the reason is our government won't let us study it. How do you take so much down from their pain medicines? Are you using um, a 10% reduction in our cost? It, it really depends on the patient. If there's a patient that I really want to get off their opioids immediately, I'll do 30% a week. And yes, they might have some withdrawal symptoms and stuff. That's where clonidine is useful. Um, but if there's a patient that really wants to get off their opioids and they're you know, determined to get off of it, I might do once a month, I might come off 20% or so. so. I had a patient on 600, 600 morphine equivalents when he came to me. Three months ago, he's on 300 now. So it's just a slow reduction. We went 600 to 500 to like 420, 360, 300. So just slowly over a few months. Who's next? Hi. Hi. Can you comment on the 
the discussion you can have with the patient about how opioids are sensitizing to pain over time. And so give us some tips about how to go through that with patients. So the way I look at that is if you have a home loan, say you have a, a loan for a house, and you start paying it with a credit card, okay? So you pay it with a credit card one month, right? You open another credit card account. You pay that credit card with that, and you keep doing that. Guess what? We're still fighting an uphill battle. And your home loan's at 4%, your credit card's at 12%, the other one's at 20%. Guess what? Everything's gonna balloon and we're gonna have to pay a lot more in the end. <laughs> That's the way I look at it. Uh, thank you. Um, now, about uh, 15 years ago, Celebrex and Vioxx are gonna be the great saviors of you know, opioid alternatives. And I think we ran into problems when they were trying to promote these as cancer prevention drugs and then you could see an increased mortality rate. But is anyone comparing mortality risks or complications of you know, Celebrex and Vioxx compared to chronic opioids? I don't know of any literature that way, but I, I think that the, the use of Celebrex and Advil or any sort of NSAID can be pretty problematic and I've seen it myself. I've actually converted a patient right now. I'm in, in process of converting a patient from diclofenac daily to an opioid because they have renal failure. So I've seen it. I have a question. Excellent talk, by the way. Over here. Yeah. Excellent talk. My, uh, my question is, is that um, it's really difficult because I remember several years ago we had a health plan called Partnerships was pushing all our pain patients on methadone. <laughs> and now I get this, these, these printouts for the MMEs for methadone, so you're giving someone 40 milligrams of methadone and because of the Washington state, did some analysis and now you're at like 600 milliequivalents of MMEs for 40 of methadone or something like that. I don't know exactly right. the scale. And all of a sudden, oh my God, now you're, you're getting these yeah. letters, you got these patients on 600 plus of MMEs of methadone equivalents based on that scale done, I think it was Washington state. Can you comment on that? So methadone's a weird medicine, first of all. It can be varied between one MME to 100 MMEs per milligram. So I don't know how accurate that is, first of all. And methadone can be a very good medicine for pain management. I've had patients on 120 milligrams a day, and it works great. But at the same time, there are, there are things that people are going to look at you funny about that. On the other hand, I try not to prescribe it on elderly patients that are not that are non-malignant just because of the QT side effects from methadone. So you can get QT elongation from it. So I worry about that. And then, you know, it's a little bit variable. It can be long acting. Now, I think that that's a little over, overdrawn again with, par with partnership and other health plans that are saying, oh, you know, this is so much. Guess what? They've been on it for 30 years. Leave me alone, you know? I don't, I don't, I, again, I think that it's everybody. Yeah. 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 Which, by the way, are none are pain doctors. No, but you know. <laughs> And, and, and really, what is a methadone's conversion? What is it, right? Is it one or is it 100? Or is it? Yeah. It is, absolutely. So there's no real good answer, unfortunately. Can I answer one last question? Sure. Yes. I was wondering how you evaluate function in your patients. So I'll ask about one of my patients, for example. She went back to work after not working for 20 years. That is a great example of function. Are they working? Um, what type of activities are they doing? How much, how, I mean, one of the ways to do it is ask them to wear a watch with a pedometer to see how many steps they take every day. Simple thing. But, you know, that's the type of thing. You know, if they're not able to do that, can they walk to the mailbox? Can they walk a block? Can they walk a mile? Things like that. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thank you.